because what is impeding this tightness in Ethiopia now will definitely go away. So when that impediment goes, I do expect a better relationship between Ethiopians and Eritreans. Of course, uh, in America there are good universities. There is Yale, there is Harvard. These two institutions, which are the finest in the world, produced most of American leadership. They learned law, logic, and everything in these institutes. But, this is mine, off the record. I don't think they apply it. When it comes to leadership, they don't apply it. If we see the history of the United States and the nations it supported, and it's still supporting, it's ridiculous. The U.S. supported Zaire, Mobutu, which is a venture of Africa. And then, let's not repeat history. The U.S. supports now the, uh, the Nazi regime. The Nazi, I mean, in everything in life, when there is size, there is the responsibility that comes with size. The regime in Ethiopia, Ethiopia is a large country compared to East Africa, even within Africa. It's one of the largest countries in Africa now. But the regime that lives in Ethiopia has completely failed to assume that responsibility, but the West anyhow is carrying this failed state. And then that probably imposing its will on other countries. Regarding the border issue, are other Ethiopian? At that time there was a very heated discussion. But what came after the discussion, what the Ethiopian regime talked about, I remember my dad said, my dad called me that night, especially when it was announced, my dad called me and said, hey, congratulations, why? But it is ours. Are you sure? Because that's exactly what CU, CU what? <laughs> yeah, what CU must have done that. He said, we won. And actually, when I heard it here, you know, we knew here that Ethiopia lost. But the Ethiopian people were told, we won. This is the kind of regime we have. And then eventually I told my dad, no, we have lost. So, the West has been running this team, I mean, for a long time. The West runs when it, where its interest is. And then the West is against a self-reliable, strong nation. And the current regime in Ethiopia, everything it does is towards its own interest, just like the US, towards its own small minority interest. It doesn't really care for what happens to the rest of Ethiopia. So the two interests, the West interest and the especially the, the interest of the United States and the interest of the regime, the TPLF regime has really merged. And that has worked for, for at least for the time being. I don't think we will go like that. For our strengths matters. The things that we do together matters. Let's do it together. Let me go to uh, my uh, presentation now. This is the uh, topic of given crisis in Ethiopia, its consequences, and a way forward. Well, we see three things here crisis, consequences, and a way forward. Basically, if I randomly pick one person from here and then ship it to Ethiopia, he or she definitely would never have a problem studying or making a research on a crisis in Ethiopia. It's visible. You can see it anywhere. There is a problem. If there is a problem, probably it could be lack of information. Because Ethiopia, as we speak now, is a black hole of information. You can't get information, but definitely you can, you can clearly see there are crises in Ethiopia. So, there are the crises, the consequences, and the way forward. What are the crises? How did they come into being? And what are the consequences that come as a result of this crisis? And then how do we get rid of them? These are the three things that I want to share with you. I want you to participate, especially in the question and answer session. Really, I want you to participate. Uh, most of you, most of you, I believe, this way or the other way, negatively or positively, your life, especially your past life, has been affected by the name Ethiopia. And definitely, it will be affected again. What happens in Ethiopia affects the east of Africa, the whole of Africa. So, st to stop this, we need to know what the crises are and then how to go forward. To give a good country for the next generation of Ethiopian territories, we have to discuss these things openly. 
How did you come here? How did Ethiopia come to this crisis? In Ethiopia, political, social, economic inequalities are century old trends. They are not new. They didn't just come over, over, overnight or in 1991 when the TPLF assumed power in Addis Ababa. They were there. The difference is, for the, probably for the past so many years, the difference is that there is one emperor that everything he wants, he passes away, and then there is a fight between the different warlords, and then the, the one powerful comes, be it Johannes, Menelik, or Theodros, whoever comes, and then the thing continues. Ayres Nasi came for a very long time. Feudalism, feudalism was defeated by Magus Maria, then came socialism and military dictatorship. The difference was other of feudalism, the next system was communism, and then military dictatorship. In 1991, the military dictatorship came, and then that was done into uh, socialism. But when the ethnic dictatorship came, it came with uh, democracy, what is that? Revolutionary democracy. Something I, I, I googled this thing so many times, I don't even find it. And nobody knows what revolutionary democracy is, probably except Manus. And then, uh, after, probably after now, nobody knows because we don't know what Manus is. <laughs> the principal problem in Ethiopia has always been the existence of ethno-nationalist groups. This has been a problem, definitely. The, the desire to control. Back in the day when I was probably when I was I wasn't born, there was some kind of federation between Ethiopia and Eritrea. And it's last I came, it took away the federation, basically took the freedom of people and told them, you need to be under my control. That is what ethno-nationalist groups do. Do everything, design everything in a way that benefits their own interest, minority interest. What the TPN referendum, the same thing. The only thing is the change. It was, there was a, somewhat the Amara domination for a long time. That came to an end in 1991. Ever since, we have another ethno-nationalist group, which is basically even more dangerous than the previous one, because this one is a tiny minority. So they are usually the majority are neglected. In this kind of ethno-nationalist dominated nations, the majority is neglected. When the so-called Amharas dominated Ethiopia for so many years, if you see to the Amara the regime, regime and go and see how individual Amaras lived, it is sad. I've been to different parts of uh, the Amara, especially the, uh, the Shoah part. I've been to Manz, I've been to Marabete, I've been to Shankora, which is uh, um, Ifat and uh, Manz. So many places I have been there. And the way people live is I, I, I'm from Sidamu, much worse than Sidamu. They, they, they're not even communicated, they don't even communicate to each other. So once the rainy season starts, that's it. It's goodbye until September comes. So this is how they lived, while the elite lived basically a higher level life. So the majority is neglected. If we come to the TPLF regime now, it's the same thing actually. It's worse now because the, the so-called Tigrians were themselves, I mean their nobility benefited at the time of Haile Selassie. Now in their regime nobody benefits unless they have some kind of, like, there are this, you know, Shumbash. <laughs> they have that kind of Ethiopians, of course, who will work with them. Other than that, the majority of Ethiopians are neglected in every ethno-nationalist, uh, when, whenever an international group takes power in Ethiopia. And the, the most important problem in Ethiopia today is the problem of ethno nationality. There is the Tigrayan nationalism, the Tigrayan elite that dominates power, we'll see now, and then neglects everybody else. The rule of law, of course, and the, the constitution. Ethiopia has a constitution, but the, the TPLF regime goes through the constitution sometimes, around the constitution sometimes, whatever it fits. It doesn't really care for what is written on the constitution. When everything in the, in the constitution doesn't fit its policy or what it wants to do, it can probably one night, overnight, policy comes. The CEO, everybody else, the CEO, to put CEO in, in, in jail 
They just assembled overnight, wrote a, a rule, assembled the parliament and passed it. Just like that. So they don't really care for the constitution. The fundamental polit uh, political and economic crisis of Ethiopia are extensions of the past. This is what I've been telling you so far. It is, they are extensions of the past. They're not created overnight, or they're not created by the TPLF regime, but they are extensions of the past. But the seriousness of the crisis and the danger that the country faces today are the conscious acts of the current regime in Ethiopia. The current regime in Ethiopia, especially the Manus group, they came in the name of democracy. And then they came in the name of probably, you know, getting rid of ethnic crisis from Ethiopia. But they took Ethiopia to the worst ethnic crisis. So, it says how. How, how did they uh, make it worse? How did they make it even more dangerous? There are three explanations. There is total control of political institutions. The TPLF regime totally controls, basically controls every power and institution, especially the political power. They control that. That has its own contribution to the crisis in Ethiopia. Then total, of course, when you, basically when some group controls the political institution, there is reason to it because whenever you control the political institutions, you basically control the economic uh, uh, institutions. Basically, you, uh, the Ethiopian economy is basically is, is totally dominated and controlled by the TPLF elites. They are millionaires everywhere, their companies roam wherever. They have headquarters in, in uh, Makale and then they roam everywhere. Everywhere there is money, and everywhere there is raw material, and everywhere there are resources. And then they control social, civic, and legal institutions. One good example, let me give you one good example about this, the, these institutions. Parties within the four grand parties, you know this year, that is this amorphous coalition called EPRDF. Within EPRDF, there are four parties, the TPLF, the OPDO, the Southern Organization, and then the Andam, the Amara group. These are, the three are basically, just like God created us by his own image, these are, the three are created by the image of Manus. Basically, he just, you know, made them and created them, so because it gives them the, the mandate to rule over Ethiopia. Let's see now. You see the Oromia region here, the Oromia zone, represented by OPDO. Number of uh, seats, house seats, 178. Number of uh, percentage of total seats from the total, 32.5. You can see how huge it is. The Ethiopian House of Representatives have has 577 seats. Out of that amount of seats, the OPDO or the Oromia region has 178 seats. Let's go to the Amara zone. It has 100 cents, uh, is represented by Andam, and then it has 138 seats in the National Parliament, House of Representatives. Out of that, that is 25% two of the total. Add the two. 25 and 35, 25.2 and 32.5. That is the share of the two large ethnic groups in, Amara, in Ethiopia, the Amaras and the Oromos. Now there is the uh, SEPDF, the South, which is my home. They have 123 seats in the parliament, which is 22.5.3. If you add those three, that is no part of Ethiopia would compare to that. That's, absolute, that's not just majority, but the absolute majority. Now the, third, the fourth party, look at it, TPLF, 38 seats. They have 38 seats. And then they have, they have 6.9% of the total seats. Now, what I want you to see is, look at these figures here. Compare the 6.9%, the 38, 22.5, 123, 25.2, 138, 32.5, and 178. Put that in your back, the back of your mind, and then read this. Their sovereignty shall be there, 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 there. Sovereignty shall be expressed through their representatives, which is this number, elected in accordance with the constitution and through their democratic participation. So this is what the, the TPLF tells us, is a democratic participation. Let's go to the next page. Now, out of that representative, sovereignty comes out of the parliament, which is basically political power. 
Now let's see the political power. Political power distribution in Ethiopia. TPLF, 80%. The other three, 20%. This is, this is what sovereignty is in Ethiopia. You know, the, the, the seats do not, are not translated into power. But that's exactly contrary to the constitution Mendes himself wrote. Economic power distribution. I think the economic power, I mean, everybody knows about uh, that giant power status. What, what, what do they call it? Effort. Effort basically controls Ethiopia. Once uh, Svat Naga was asked about effort, then he answered, effort belongs to the Tigrayans, but it works everywhere in Ethiopia. This is, this is in, the, in the VOA. It belongs to the Tigray people, but it has the mandate to work everywhere in Ethiopia because Ethiopia is controlled by himself, by Sabat. So, economic distribution. TPLF, 65%. The other three, which is basically, the other three is basically Ethiopia. And if you see, most of you know Ethiopia, and then uh, you know where the distribution of resources are. And then uh, compared to Grain or resource-wise, I think everybody will laugh. <laughs> but look at the uh, economic power distribution. The other three, which includes the Oromo region, 65%. I come from the south. The south is a very resourceful area. The, the, the gold that has been given to Alamudi comes from the south. Not very far from my, where I live, Shakiso. Some, some of you might, might know. Most of the countries, the, uh, the wood product comes from the south, Jam Jam. Most of the livestock comes from Morana. And uh, the, the uh, other parts of uh, Morana, especially the, uh, the Agaramara area. And coffee. Coffee. Especially the so-called Washi coffee, Tata Babuna. That comes from my part of Ethiopia. That's a very resource part, resourceful part. But look at this participation. This 35% is the participation of the three, the Amhara, the Oromo, and the, the South. They have 35% of it. But resource-wise, they have 95% of Ethiopian resource. This is how economically dominated Ethiopia is. Let's go to the most important one, what actually opens the door for the other two. Military and security power distribution. Look at there. The TPLF, 90%. Six million people. I'm not sure there are six, but their own statistics, statistics say it's six million. Six million people control 90% of the Ethiopian military, police, and security. And this is exactly what gives them power to control the other two. The other three, three percent. I have a lot of videos. I wish I wish I could have I could have brought them. I have a lot of videos that really show the graduation ceremonies, speeches within the military, and different things. In each graduation ceremony, in each speech, in each uh, institutional undertakings, the people, Colonel Egalegale, it is the Tigrayan Colonel, General, 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 variety of generals. These are some of them. They don't even have the qualification to be generals. They don't, really, they don't. And then one interesting thing, in Ethiopia, there is a rule now. When these the former fighters of the TPLF, when they are looking for a job, that amount of years they spend in the, in, in the... will be counted as an experience. It doesn't matter if they are going to engineering field, management field, whatever field, it will be counted. Guys, I have worked in this country for the last 16 years. And then especially my resume is like, it has, it's divided into two. The, my professional resume does not include the things that I work in McDonald's. Mm -hmm. I don't include that in my professional resume because it's useless. Mm -hmm. But it is very important to the TPLF. It doesn't matter because nobody can say why or how they do it anyhow. So everything in the security, in the, in the power area, in the military area is totally controlled by the TPLF uh, regime. And how does this contribute to crisis? Let's see this uh, reality of Ethiopia. So 2% of the total area of Ethiopia is Oromia. And 75% of Ethiopians are Oromos. 
14% of the total area of Ethiopia is the Amhara zone. And 25.9% of Ethiopians are Amharas. The Oromos and the Amharas make up more than half of the Ethiopian population. Maybe more than 65% of Ethiopians are the combination of the Oromos and the Amharas. When these two large groups of the nation are controlled by, by a tiny minority, nobody would accept that. That is exactly why we have all this liberation fraud, liberation fraud, and all these opposition fronts in, 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 in Ethiopia and in uh, different parts of Africa, and of course in the diaspora here, in the western part of the diaspora. 90% of Ethiopia, the Ethiopian people do not want to be dominated and their resources exploited by just 6% of the grants. Nobody will want to see this. Uh, the TPLF might say Ethiopia is peaceful, Ethiopia is uh, uh, stable, or whatever. But the reality is Ethiopia is neither. It's not neither stable, peaceful, or uh, stay, I mean, uh, a place to be governed. Because it is a human nature. It is a human nature not to accept total, whatever kind of domination. Imagine what happened in Eritrea when that flag was taken down back in the day. And that is what resulted into this, into independence, because people did not want to accept independent freedom with slavery. And that went to struggle, and look what the translation is. And this is what's coming to Ethiopia too. If we don't solve these problems, if we don't really sit together, this way, liberation movement, all this picture shows us how volatile the Horn of Africa is, and then how a very minor conflict between nations can easily be go, I mean, get out of control and engulf the entire region. Ethiopia is the largest country of the Horn, and it suffers from protracted political strife, what I just said, identity politics. One of, one of the most important, really, problems in Ethiopia is identity politics. In the past, for the last 100 or 200 years, the identity of different people or nationalities have, has been demolished. And people live in another identity. Or people try to be another person to live as a human being, to even be considered as a human being. That, you know, Agatha the French is a very important aspect, especially in our history, both the and Ethiopians. We don't like that. We don't like when Agatha the French. So we blindly support them, like most Ethiopians support them in the 1998 Ethiopian war. I don't think that will happen now, because most Ethiopians have known. And in fact, I, I heard uh, recently my dad, I have an 89 years old dad, and then I asked him about the Ethiopian and uh, Eritrean figure, and, uh, I mean, um, conditions. He said, I, a friend, forget it. If the Eritreans come and roam in Addis, the tanks come and roam in Addis, people will put flour on them. <laughs> That's exactly how it's going to happen. It. These people in Ethiopia. Uh, the international conflict creates humanitarian crisis. You know, nobody knows better than you. The, nine, the 2019 war has totally, really, I mean, destabilized Eritrea. And then so many Eritreans that came back from 30 years war went back again. The huge humanitarian crisis. This creates in Probably in the Ethiopian case, it could create in Eritrea, it could create in Kenya, Sudan, now another country, South Sudan, Djibouti, and well, I don't know about Somalia. <laughs> the conflict, the conflict consumes a large proportion of the nation's financial and human capital, like it did in the Eritrean war. Most Ethiopians, I mean, proportionally, I mean, a large number of Ethiopians died in that in that war. Some of them deliberately; they were pushed there. As, as, a, as, a, uh, as a test organ, human test organ. <laughs> After the end of the conflict, the country starts all over again and the crisis continues from square one again. As long as we can't get rid of this regime, this will be a vicious circle that repeats itself. Scenario two. Look at these things. Oromo Liberation Front, Sidama Liberation Front, Ogaden Liberation Front, Gabela Liberation Front, the Great People Democratic Movement, Amara Democratic Force Movement. This is the thing. Basically, Ethiopia is the country of the land of liberation movements. Why do we see all these liberation movements? 
because of the power structure I showed you before. Nobody wants to be dominated. If Ethiopia has to be stable, and if Ethiopia has to be one government, single country, then power should be shared equally. This thing is create all these problems. These are destabilizing forces. When these things come into action, imagine what happens in Ethiopia and the surrounding regime. There are inter intermittent ethnic clashes within Ethiopia. There are different ethnic clashes. Recently, it was in the international news between uh, the Gari, the Gari Somalis, and the, uh, the Boranas in the southern part of the country, where 20,000 people overnight fled to Kenya. That is what, inter when I say it creates international crisis, that is what international crisis, because Kenya is involved now. And then there is ethnic conflict between the, or the Oromos and the Somalis. And then the, uh, the Nur and the Anyuak in Gambella. The Guji and the Gedeo. The Guji and the Burji. And uh, in the Beshangul area, the Gumus and the Amhara. The Gumus and the Oromo. All these conflicts, deliberately done and planted conflicts by this regime. The land grab has turned peasants into fighting force. Uh, you, you know well about the Ethiopian land grab. Now, and anybody who wants land large, they just simply, you know, get some amount of money, go to Ethiopia, give up, you get land. In Gambella, people have started fighting now. Hopelessness is driving a large outflow of the educated and the young. From Ethiopia, a large group of educated people and the young leave the country. Higher unemployment and the galloping inflation has made life in Ethiopia unbearable. This has its own political consequences, which ultimately, ultimately leads to the crisis of the region. Two of the nation's large religious groups are in turmoil, the, especially the, the movement of the Ethiopian Muslim, and then of course the Waldeba crisis. This has really changed Ethiopia into probably a war scenario. And these are deliberately done because the TPLF wants control. They have already controlled the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. In the same way, they want to control the, um, the Muslim uh, faith, especially the leadership level. Now, the Muslim has probably has been there for the past probably one year now. They want to have their own leadership, and the members have said no. So there is a big conflict, and that might take another scenario, another uh, dimension. Ethiopia in its history has never seen political Islam because of the Christian dominance and then the, the, the peaceful coexistence between these two religious groups for the last probably 1.5 thousand years. That might not be the case now. The makeup of Ethiopia. Look at Tigrinya speakers. There are Tigrinya speakers in the northern part of Ethiopia, Tigray and Eritrea. And then the Anyuak in the southwest. There are Anyuak in Ethiopia and Anyuak in Sudan and Anyuak in, well, I'm in South Sudan. And then the Somalis in the east. There are ethnic Somalis in Ogaden who are Ethiopians. And then there are Somalis in Somalia. Look at the Afars, and this is even larger. There are Afars in Eritrea, and then Afars in Ethiopia, and then Afars in uh, Djibouti. Three countries. Look at the Boranas and the, the, all these Nilotic people in the south. They are in both sides of the border. I was in Kenya for one year and now the refugee in, uh, in Kenya. There are the Kenyas call them Boranas. The same way we call our, um, our Oromo group in the south Boranas. So there are so Kenya Boranas and then Ethiopia Boranas. Look at how intertwined are people in this region. Some group living in Ethiopia, another group living in another country. And then imagine when a war breaks up in Ethiopia, when there is crisis, ethnic clashes, stability, when all these things come to Ethiopia, look what happens. All these people, they, they go to the other side. What happens in Ogaden? affects what happens in Somalia, and what happens in Somalia affects what happens in Ogaden. So, all these are things like time bombs, that whenever they, uh, you know, bombard or explode, just engulf the region into fire. Let's see this, and I'm, I'm, I'm probably I have one, two more slides. Look at this. That is, I want you to see uh, the, two, the two boxes. There is mass murder in Ogaden. 
basically the TPLF regime, it does the same thing that it claims Derg did to it. They always talk about the, the Hausen massacre, but they are doing worse than in Ogaden. Hausen, yeah. The Hausen, not Hausen? Yeah. yeah. Uh, there is imposing, uh, imposing religious will on the Muslim community. Basically, the Ethiopian regime is... This is, this is a very funny regime. Sometimes it's just a funny, it's just a child regime. I mean, you, there are, we have seen so many oppressive regimes in Ethiopia in, in, in different parts of the world. But this regime, they are basically telling the Ethiopian Muslim, this, you know, this kind of Muslim belief is not good to you. Please worship this. They can even give you what you, tell you what to worship. This is, I mean, worship is the most sacred thing that you have a relationship between you and God. But the TPLF wants to even cut that and then tell you, hey, don't worship this and worship that. This is the beginning of the crisis in Ethiopia. Now, if you go to the second box, there is collapse of the state authority in Somalia. And then unresolved conflict between Ethiopia and Eritrea. The, the, the border issue is not yet settled. Actually, it's settled, but from the point of Ethiopia, it's not settled. Or maybe from the point of TPLF, it's not settled yet. This should have been a foregone conclusion. Because the, the, the Palace Group went to court. When you go to court, especially to the kind of arbitrary court, you agree, you, you go the, to the binding agreement. Or whatever the court says, yeah, I'll be abided by it. They went there with that statement. But the outcome, they didn't like the outcome. Since the West is with them, they didn't accept the outcome. So that is unresolved. And then growing tension between Sudan and South Sudan. We see that daily. And then emerging elements of political Islam in the region. Basically, you know, this movement towards this power with, with uh, you know, the Islam phase. If you see from the, the, the intervention in Somalia, it has, a, it has a collapsed state. The collapsed state in Somalia cannot be fixed or mended as long as Ethiopia is putting its hand on Somalia. It will never be fixed. It will be like that forever, and it has its own crisis. Again, if you see that intervention in Somalia, look at this, emerging elements of political Islam in the region. Yeah. You know, they, they, I mean, there are Muslims in Ethiopia, Eritrea, Sudan, and uh, Somalia. When these things continue, then this thought, maybe we should, you know, group or, you know, go and create some kind of group that takes, gives us political power. And instead of fighting for freedom, right, and democracy, they start fighting now for political Islam, which will take the region into the worst crisis that it has ever seen. And this has been played by the TPLF regime. So, in the other side, if you see the other arrow, emerging elements of political Islam in the regime, and imposing religious will on the Muslim community. They are tied to each other. So these things reinforce each other. A force in the upper four uh, box enforces another element in the lower and the vice versa. Now, and then we know what the crisis can do in Ethiopia, Sudan, South Sudan, Eritrea, Djibouti, Somalia and Kenya. This is a large community. So it can easily, the crisis in Ethiopia can easily spill over in all of these countries. So what should we do? The first thing is break the century old cycle. Remember when I started my uh, presentation in Ethiopia? The inequality, the problem is a century old problem. It's just one dictator replaces the other. We must break that cycle. It's got to be broken. If we can't break that, then the we can't really solve the crisis. We can't even see the crisis. To get to do number one, we must get rid of the TPLF regime. The TPLF regime definitely should should definitely go away. As long as that regime is in power, it's very difficult to bring the those all, especially the two sisterly countries, the Eritreans and Ethiopians. These are basically, as I told you uh, before, I, mean, I have an interest in Ethiopia and Eritrea. In fact, at the, probably next summer I have a plan to go to Eritrea because I want to see my, uh, my, uh, 
14 years old son to go to Eritrea and see his another country because he cannot anymore go to Ethiopia because of my political involvement. He can't go to Ethiopia. So he has to see the other country. This is, we're close to each other, so we, 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 need, we need to get rid of the TPLF regime. That is where the relationship between Ethiopians and Eritreans come. Because we have a common enemy, we have a common interest, which is peace and stability and living together and grow together as a, as a, as a community. For those common interests lead us to fight a common enemy, which is this, this bad, bad boy. And then establish, not only get rid of the TPLF regime, protect the emergence of another dictatorship in Ethiopia, and establish a power-sharing government in Ethiopia. This is a key. This is a key. The only way to get rid of the, you know, OLF, OLF, and whatever LF, Liberation Front, we need to share power. When we share power, we share resources. And then, uh, you know, the country goes to the right track. The other thing, create inclusive political and economic institutions. I have told you the, the TPLF political institution, which is exclusive only for the TPLF elites, and then the economic benefit they, uh, they reap. So close that and create inclusive political and economic institutions in Ethiopia. And then make the regional organizations like IGAD, you know IGAD, and even OU, make those institutions organizations of people, not just organizations of leaders. This is very important. We, the people, should be, I mean, those all people who live in Eritrea should know about IGAD and should, be, should get the, the, the channel to be involved in the IGAD day to day things. What is IGAD doing? What is my input in IGAD? What is my input in OAU? Because OAU, sorry, OU, OAU, AU affects my life. If AU affects my life, I need or I must affect the direction of a a AU at least at my level. So those organizations should be not just organizations of whiskey drinking leaders, they should be organizations of leaders. And then promote the South-South cooperation. A very good example. Promote relationship, trade, culture, and education, science between Eritrea and Ethiopia. This is South-South. Basically South-South between developing countries. And instead of just all of us collectively looking at the norms, which is the developing part of the world, let's start creating South-South link. Promote multilateral trading within a country. Within Eritrea, there should be trading multilateral with the different communities of Eritrea. That should be developed, and we should be participating in that. We should push that. Most importantly, promote bilateral trading between countries. You know, when I was in uh, Asmara, I, I, I liked the Gulf of the <laughs> Shura. Everywhere you want, you go, I mean, there was Shura in Eritrea. Everywhere you go, I was trading. I didn't see anywhere in Ethiopia. And then those, those uh, shrubs were really, I mean, we saw them in Ethiopia. We didn't know where it came from, but we saw them in Ethiopia. And most Ethiopians like that shrub. So as long as the Eritreans have comparative advantage in producing those, then we should trade them bilaterally between Ethiopia and Eritrea. Not only this, but in a variety of ways. Minimize trade barriers between countries, Ethiopia and Sudan, Ethiopia and uh, Eritrea, Eritrea and Sudan, you know the mesh between the different countries, for the sake of collective growth, we should minimize those. Increase level of regional self-reliance. Nobody knows this more than the Eritreans who have already started that. That is the most important thing. The very first thing comes from self-reliance. Let me give you an example. I was a sprinter when I was... Uh, in high school. In fact, I was a good sprinter. I wasn't as big as you see me now. But, um, every time I sprinted, even if when I was beaten, even when I was beaten, I believed that I can win. I always believed I can win. You know my, my bolt. Somebody who stands beside bolt and starts that sprinting, instead of thinking about how to beat bolt. If he starts thinking, oh God, I can't beat this person, then he's lost. 
even before you know taking the first step, that guy has lost because mentally he has lost. So self reliance is a very important thing. You guys who have started this, pass it, share it, and let's have it collectively. And then last, we Africans must be allowed to solve our national and regional problems. The last one is very important. When there is disagreement between us, just like, you know, if you go to the country side there, I mean, the, the, the different, what, Adidas, Agarachus, the, the, the elderly, they solve problems. So we can have collective elders that solve our problems. We should not go always to the West. You know, whenever conflict comes, whenever disagreement arises, we should not look for the West. We should look within us. So if we can do all these things, and most of them collectively, I do believe, and I firmly believe, the pride for the next I came from San Rosa and uh, really I'm proud of you guys and I have simple question maybe people they make me funny but the question is um, Susan Rice's uh, uh, baby is missing <laughs> his name is Melissa <laughs> now Washington Post because 
no directives were forthcoming. And without directives, these uh, stenographers of power, to power <laughs> basically don't know what to say, what to write, what, what to regurgitate uh, every news cycle. So in the case of Mendes, you, you can see some indication of that, about how the Western media is reacting to it. Um, they're, uh, you know, navigating the websites of uh, opposition, uh, even opposition forces and blogs of individuals to, to try to make some sense out of it. Um, but uh, we have to be on guard also. When Mendes goes, another Mendes is on the pipeline, is, is being groomed and ready. Some speculate uh, maybe is C. Abraham, that kind of, uh, uh, you know, is he able to take that mantle? Uh, because they, they certainly have been grooming him here at Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He certainly had that military to military ties because he was if I'm not mistaken, uh, the defense minister at one time, and you know, uh, the, the, the strong man of the EPLF before he fell out of favor and uh, broke with Mendes in Nawi. So, uh, what we, though, as uh, you know, people in resistance, uh, both in Ethiopia and in Israel, need to, uh, to gird ourselves, to, to ready ourselves, is that in the unfolding uh, you know, period of uncertainty that no other favorite dictator steps in power. That really this time around, you know, things stabilize and uh, all the opposition forces in Ethiopia and in the region as well uh, don't get caught by surprise and uh, prolong uh, the miseries of uh, you know, the Ethiopian peoples and the peoples of the whole of Africa. So uh, it is the responsibility on our side is that you know, to be ready for any eventuality and to continue the struggle to resist this, uh, this domination. That, that's my, uh, my take on the situation. Well, my question to you pertains to, I believe you, your, your position is you're the head of the Diplomatic and Foreign Relations Department within your organization, which is known as the Gumbut Sabat, right? I want to know exactly what your uh, your stance, your political stance, is on the sovereignty of Eritrea to begin with, and secondly, what your position is as far as the border issue is concerned, pertinent to Eritrea and uh, Ethiopia. The reason I'm asking this to you, as you know, when Ethiopia declared the war on Eritrea back in May of 1998, it did so with the endorsement of the so-called uh, Ethiopian Parliament. So, as far as I know. That declaration has not been re officially repealed. So, would your organization repeal it if and when it has that opportunity to be at the leadership stage? Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a very nice question, um, especially on the sovereignty of Eritrea. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, and then as far as my organization is concerned. Eritrea is a sovereign region. It's a country, it's a nation by itself now. So that sovereignty and that territorial integrity will fully be accepted and of course respected by my organization. You know, everything, everything we do comes out of that respect. You know, even at the individual level, if we don't respect each other, we can't do anything. We, we might try on force, but force repeats itself and then just keeps on doing it, damaging both parties. We have seen that for so many years, and then we have given our beloved children for this day, recently in 2000 and, uh, 1999. So, in everything we do, our you know, our understanding of this relationship, especially the mature relationship between uh, Gbosabat and our, our call to Gbosabat because this is an organization. Gbosabat does not represent the Ethiopian people. You very well understand that because it's not, it's not elected by the Ethiopian people. But we do fight for the freedom of the Ethiopian people. So what we reflect is our belief in our, our, our 
a very firm stand. If we didn't respect, and if we didn't have that deep, deep respect from deep inside us, we wouldn't have come and then uh, uh, ask for help and then, you know, get rid of this regime. That would have been suicidal. Not only suicidal, disrespect. And then I do believe, and my organization believes, nothing could be done with dis disrespecting the other party. And at a personal level, at a personal level, uh, I have seen probably some, some of you might not even have seen what I saw in Eritrea. When I went to Eritrea as a young boy, 22 years of age, I was a product of Mangistu. A lot of propaganda in me. The Arab Dalala. I think it would make sense in Amharic. <laughs> because I am a product of that propaganda. And I'm a very strong nationalist person, just like you are, guys. When you see the Eritrean flag, I know what, what you feel deep inside of you. And I feel the same thing when I see the Ethiopian flag. So those things, those two flags can stand together only if, and only if the two nations and the two people, the two governments and the two, most importantly, the two people respect each other. I saw my friend, a friend of me, one day, especially on our trip to Adikai, no, no, our, our, our trip to Adikwala, between, I think, between Mandefara and Asmara, somewhere there was this explosion. And a friend of mine who graduated from college was me. His car was the first car, just by chance, he died. A few minutes after he died, I was there. A few minutes after he died, so called the Fatma Darash, the, uh, especially the, the uh, airborne group came. And I saw what they did to the innocent people that live in the different Addis in that area. The Addis, Addi. I have seen how they literally demolished areas. And I did know that that was the sick, just one isolated incident. That has been going on for 30 years. So my own classmates, that the friends I sat together, I saw them in Eritrea fighting. And they come from the war front from Algena and different places. We come to Asmara and have fun. The next time they come, one or two are missing. It's devastating. I have missed a piece of mind. So if we have to continue together, we have to respect the territorial integrity of each other, the sovereignty of each other, we do that. Uh, brother is that, um, I think it was three years ago, Elias Kipler from uh, Ethiopian Review. And at that time, there was a lot of hope amongst the Eritreans and Ethiopians that maybe something positive will come out of it and that both peoples in the United States or in the diaspora will work together um, for their common interests. If uh, positive things are going to come out, People of both countries have to be working together uh, for uh, uh, mutual respect, as it's been stated, and for mutual goals and, and all of that. And what is your suggestion you know, to doing that? And what uh, uh, pushed him to stray away from the directions that he was going? Thank you. Okay, let me go back to my uh, role in Kumbo uh, Sabat as uh, head of diplomacy. I think, in the, especially uh, since the middle of uh, July, my colleagues uh, told me that I think I talked too much maybe. They made me a PR chief. So currently, I, am, I lead the PR department of Kumbo Sabat than the diplomacy. But anyway, I will answer that question of uh, the, the, the diplomatic question because at, at the time I was one of the top diplomats of the organization. Uh, it, it is, you know, it, Ethiopia and Eritrea, in the past, we've gone through a lot of, let me say, hell. Especially the resistance war, the independence war, has isolated the two communities. And, they, and this is a fact. And this happens. And this happened for a reason. But I'm sure that that dirty time or era, I think, has cooled down. That's exactly why you see me here today. And you'll see more. So, to come together 
the very, the very thing. There are extremist elements in the Ethiopian community, especially in the diaspora. Extremely extreme elements. Who say, who still declare, there are some radio stations in the diaspora, especially in my part of diaspora, when they uh, start their program, Ethiopia, you know, the 14 provinces, you know what 14 is? Hey, yeah, there are elements like that. These are very, very, you know, extremist, extremist elements. But we, have, we do have those extremist elements still in our community. And that I don't want to hide that. Still, in the Eritrean community, there are still your own extremist elements. Let's cancel out both. The majority in, in the center. What does the majority want? Peace. Co peaceful coexistence. Continue with that historical tie. Ethiopia and Eritrea are very close, very sisterly, brotherly, and then very tied than any other country in the world. So we should develop that. And we should continue on that. And that comes, you know, it's, there is a mutual interest. It's not that Ethiopia, Eritrea needs more Ethiopia because Ethiopia is huge. No, it is Ethiopia needs Eritrea too. We need each other. When we need each other, then we need to do things that brings us together. We need to cool down, to tone down our extremist elements. We do that. I think in Gimbosovat, we do that. We do tone down those very, very, you know, uh, very negative elements who don't respect for sovereignty. So people who live in the 60s or probably more than that. Let's, let me tell you about one country, uh, Israel, in the world. Look at the importance of Israel in the world. In the world. Does it come out of size? Everybody knows that importance comes probably, it is a borrowed importance from the United States and then of course within Israel itself. So importance does not necessarily come from size of Ethiopia and Eritrea need each other, we need to work toward that. In fact, we need to work more than us to the, to the coming generation. I do have a son. I do have a 14 years old son. I always tell him you are a blessed boy because you're born in the United States of America, you have that citizenship by naturally Whoever is born in this country is a citizen of this country, a national of this country. And this boy has a, a rich Eritrean heritage because his mom is Eritrean. And then he has a rich Ethiopian heritage because his dad is Ethiopian. I don't want to lose this. I don't want to put myself in a box and make him fight, make him really against his own country, which is 50% of Ethiopia, 50% Eritrean. So, to do that, the way we are responsible, the guy who asked me the question, you are responsible. I am responsible. Everybody here is responsible. When we teach our kids, we need to teach them the good parts of our history so that the other part, let them grow, read, and find out that. Let them not, let's not tell them the ugly things. Let them, let's tell them, let's teach them that these are nations that can live together, helping each other, grow helping each other, trade between each other, and then share different culture, history, and everything together. We can do that if we do teach our kids the positive things. If we talk ourselves the positive things. Let's do that. If we do that, we'll definitely do that. Regarding Elias, I, I think Elias, only Elias can answer that question, why he, he actually is not part of the, he was the most, the vocal supporter of Eritrean, especially the, the state of Eritrea, supporting the Ethiopian opposition parties. He was vocal on that. No more. I think he can answer that. But from, from the other part, of, from my own, my own part of our experience, I can tell you that we work with the Eritrean government, with the Eritrean people, to get rid of this cancer so that we can live a healthy life. Uh, with that, we're going to conclude uh, this panel discussion. I would like to thank uh, Elias, Mr. Graham Ford, Mr. Efrem for coming and sharing with us uh, this.